welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host, our guest author, Francis X. Mayer, his book, True Confessions, Voices of Faith from a Life in the Church, published by our friends over at Ignatius Press, naturally available through our EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com for all things Catholic. Fred, it's good to see, good to see you see again. You, yeah. uh, you know, people uh, will have seen you on with Father Mitch when you were in uh, talking about uh, this book as well. And people obviously in the church know you very well for your association, long time with a member of our board for many years. Right. A wonderful, wonderful bishop, great friend of ours, uh, Archbishop Shepu. He's a great guy. And right. it was a wonderful thing working for him. And that informed, the, you know, right. uh, formed a lot of my comments that I make in the book. Right. So how many years did you actually work with them? Because you were in 23 years. 23 years. Senior aide for 23 years, yeah. Now from and, Denver on? Was that uh, what From it was Denver good? on, yeah. Okay. It was, uh, when I first met him, he said, you don't need to be communications chief, you need to be my chief of staff. So, right. And that, I did that for 23 years, and it was a great relationship. So was, the first time you met him was when you met him in what, in Rapid City? Or? Uh, I met him in Rapid City when I brought our report for the right, diocese right. up to him, you know, and... and uh, when he had been named. Yeah, right. he had been okay. named, but it wasn't public yet. Right. And uh, well, I liked him immediately. Right. I made the mistake of calling him Archbishop when he was still a bishop. bishop. He said, no, 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 you know, so... Uh, you were prophetic. Yeah, prophetic, yeah. So. Uh, uh, it was a great relationship, and it certainly uh, changed my life for the better. I mean, it was a wonderful, wonderful collaboration. What was the great insight you saw in him that helped your your own spiritual life? Uh, well, you know, you could you could come back from any mistake with uh, Archbishop Chaput except one, which was dishonesty. Okay. He was relentlessly honest. He had zero tolerance mm -hmm. for any kind of evasion or uh, lying, and mm -hmm. I just enormously admired that. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, is that he gave, uh, he knew how to hire talented people like the CFOs that I talked with in the book mm -hmm. and let them do their job and then hold them accountable. That's the key. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he, I mean, you got a lot of freedom with him with, with, in working with him if you uh, did a good job, but you always knew he was gonna circle back and ask for an accounting, mm -hmm. which made you that much more productive. Now, it's interesting, you actually, in matter at Magistra, in the beginning, in the introduction, you actually had him was that your choice to have him do it? Did he volunteer? Did Ignatius ask him? How did that work? Uh, you mean the introduction? Yeah, the introduction. No, he volunteered to do it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, it dictates a lot of stuff. Okay. So, uh, and that's mainly the way that he works. And uh, no, it was a, that was on, that's on him. Right. He talks about in the beginning about Francis of Assisi and, and also St. Augustine, how he was attracted to these people. Yeah. And But he, he makes the connection there to the fact that they were basically lay people. They were lay people who then became clergy. Right. But uh, his attraction to them because he, you know, he entered the Capuchins without necessarily intending to be a priest. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be a Capuchin. Okay. Uh, the priesthood So followed. like a brother? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, he was led eventually to being a priest. But he admired Augustine and Francis because uh, they started as lay people. Francis was never ordained, you know. I mean, uh, and Augustine was corralled into it by the people in Hippo. Right. You know, that wasn't his intention either. So, so he has always worked very comfortably with lay people. And right. that was the reason that uh, certainly we had such a good relationship when we were Right, as he mentions, our Lord's followers were lay people, we fishermen, lay people, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. And he also points out right at the beginning that baptism is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. Why do you think he said that? Because it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the, that's the core. Uh, the most important thing in the in the church, once you're baptized, of course, is the Eucharist. That's the heart and soul of the church. Be, you don't get there until you're baptized, and baptism is the commissioning of the person, the incorporation into the believing community, the forgiveness of sins, and the commissioning to help sanctify the world. Right, right. And we all share that, all of us, every one of us. Well, he talks about the fact that, at least from his period of time, the pre-Vatican II coming out at the after Vatican II, basically, and the idea of uh, how things had changed so much and there was a lot of change for those of yeah. us who were around at that time and he talked about the fact that it's easy to lose heart in the confusion of the times but I offer you a useful piece of advice don't make that mistake do you think we're in similar times today oh absolutely you know one of the things that I, I, I try to stress whenever I talk about the church is that uh, we're very bad at remembering our history. That's partly American because we're a Novus Ordo Seclorum. You know, we don't like the past because it's mortgage right. on the future, and we like to reinvent ourselves. But that's death for Catholics, just as it would be for Jews. Jews are, the, are remain as a as a people because they have the discipline of remembering, and we need to do the same. Mm -hmm. So our history is really critical. And once you know our history, mm -hmm. as opposed to nostalgia, once you really understand the history of the church, you can you know it can get 
much, much worse. Right. But God always brings us back. And so if we have typical, difficult times now, and mm -hmm. they may get worse, right. uh, it's no reason to despair. You know, It's no reason to hide in nostalgia. I mean, we have to own our vocation and go forward from that point, because each one of us is called to be a saint. Mm -hmm. In fact, I mentioned that, I think, toward the end. Uh, the work of Georges Bernanos makes a big point of that. You know, he, he wrote an essay called um, Our Friends the Saints right. toward the end of his life. And it's a beautiful essay on the obligation of all of us um, to try to become saints. And we can do that no matter what our vocation is, you know. Now, you, were, you, you, uh, you mentioned about the fact that when you were in uh, Denver, you were made chancellor. Now, was it unusual at that time for a layperson to be a chancellor? No, uh, the 83 code uh, allowed that. But the ironic thing about that, Doug, is, is that I, I did very few chancellery things. Okay. You know, I co-signed his documents, which were his official documents. But all the legal stuff was delegated to a vice chancellor. Mm -hmm. Basically, the job was senior assistant and, and chief of staff. So when you actually went to Philadelphia and continued to do the same thing, that's different why you, yeah. you didn't have a different same. Right. I was going to ask you, why did you have a different title? Because in, in Philadelphia, it's a metropolitan city, and, uh -huh. and they have their own very elaborate um, you know, system of mm -hmm. um, the chancellor is a, is a canon lawyer, right. serious canon lawyer. I see. So you, you attended with him, uh, besides the World Meeting of Families, obviously, which we covered back in what, 2015. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you were at several of the synods. Three of them. Well, three years. And he talks about that. What was your impression of the synods? Well, 97 was brand new. I mean, he had just been appointed earlier in the year as, as archbishop, and he had been appointed by the pope personally. Um, and it was just exhilarating, you know, mm -hmm. it was the Synod of the Americas. And, and uh, he actually met Bergoglio, Jorge Bergoglio, because mm -hmm. he had also been made an archbishop. They got along very nicely at, at the 97th Synod. Mm -hmm. So it was a great experience. The 2015 and 2018 Synods were very different. I mean, they were, um, uh, let, let me put it this way, every Synod mm -hmm. is to some degree choreographed. Mm -hmm. You know that. Sure. Uh, because there's certain things that the Pope wants to accomplish. But I think there was a kind of um, um, unpleasant manipulation that went on at the 2015 and the 2018 synods that uh, uh, certainly uh, my archbishop really didn't like. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a delegate to both of those, so they were um, they were they were very different experiences. Right. Um, I'm glad I was there. I saw it firsthand. I was his support there, but but. Uh, yeah, it was a different experience. Right. So you, you say in the beginning that the book is a snapshot of the Catholic Church in the United States in the third decade of the 21st century based on your right. perspective and the many years you've served inside the church. Right. So is it developing well or is it a pretty bad picture? No, I think it's a great picture. In fact, uh, yeah, I say in the book, you know, that I when I w started working for the, for the dioceses that I worked for, I was worried I was going to lose my faith, mm -hmm. or at least have it undermined. <laughs> it was, it was just, it was exactly the opposite. I found the same thing. <laughs> yeah. you know, you see, you see the warts, you see the sins right. up close, but the the people you work with are just so much better than those problems, right. and and it it was a tremendous environment, and and so in writing the book, I, I think I mentioned this at some point, you know. I write for a living now, and right. I get tired of what I say mm -hmm. because I get tired of that whole kind of commentariat that that. Which goes you, on. you originally thought you were going to write, yeah, and then decided against. Yes, right. right. Okay. Well, I did. I did that for forty-five years instead, you right. know. But but I mean, the the. So I want. The, I did the book because I wanted to know what normal, faithful Catholics thought, from the bishops down to ordinary lay people, mm -hmm. and that experience was just fantastic because people. Uh, are frank, mm -hmm. and that's sobering, but it's also very encouraging. I mean, you hear the truth, and the truth sets you free. It doesn't necessarily make you happy, right. but it does encourage you that you're living in an environment that and has And since oxygen. you wanted honesty, is that the reason the vast majority of people, certainly in the beginning of the book, that you're dealing with at different levels are anonymous? Mm -hmm. at well, least the bishops I way. gave anonymity, that was my idea. Okay. Because you're never going to get a bishop to be uh, really frank because they can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have to be prudent in what they say in terms of public consumption because mm -hmm. what their words are are so easily misread. Mm -hmm. Once they feel safe, they do tell you what they think. Mm -hmm. And these guys were a very impressive group of people all over the country, the right. bishops were that. The only other group that I gave anonymity to were the uh, what I call the formators mm -hmm. because a number of them are on faculties I and see. they could get okay. canceled. And, and so instead of 
leaving some anonymous and some not. I just gave them all. Gave them all. Yeah. Okay. You said no attempt was made to eliminate unwelcome or inconvenient views or to force the content in directions unintended by the person speaking. Go on to say the point of this book was to hear the experiences, insights, and opinions of others, and not to share them without an interpretive, f and to share them without an interpretive filter. Right. Yeah. I didn't want to. I mean, again, I. I have an opinion about almost everything, right. as my wife right. likes to remind me. <laughs> but but uh, but I didn't want that interfering with what actually what real people thought. And so, to the degree that I could, and I, I hope I was honest. I think I was. Uh, I let them say what they wanted to say, and and uh, I think that comes through on the pages. You say my faith has always been in large part a left brain affair. How yeah, so? rational. Okay. You know, I don't normally have. Um, Spiritual, <laughs> spiritual ecstasies. I'm, I'm more systematic. I, th I somewhere I say I don't know if it's in the book or not, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a very skeptical person. The glass. You is do all, say you're skeptical. Yeah, yeah. And glass half full. Yeah. You talk about yeah, that always. perspective, I mean, right? It, unless proven otherwise, you know. But, but um, I have had experiences that were really quite spiritual and moving, and I think most people have them at some point in their lives. It's not right. something that happens all the time, but it, it, it. Uh, it can really change your life when it happens. You say, we're living through a sea change in our politics, economy, culture, and self-understanding, and the church has survived such changes before. And you quote uh, Rosa, who talks about, but there's an acceleration and alienation going on. Right. That's kind of new. Yeah. Well, here's an example. Here's a fun fact. You know, in 1993, when I began working for the Archdiocese of Denver, there were less than 200 websites online globally Okay. Now there are more than two billion. Mm -hmm. That just captures in a, in a line the, the radical difference in technology, right. information circulation, and that has huge cultural consequences. And that's accelerating because uh, technological breakthroughs create a momentum for more breakthroughs. You see it with the development of sure. artificial intelligence mm -hmm. now, uh, and nobody can get their feet on the ground. You know, and the church, remember, has been for centuries, uh, you know, written and print-based culture, you know? And now everything is shifting. Mm -hmm. Everything's sh shifting to visual imagery and things like that. So so it's a time, I, I, you know, a decade ago, and I remember the Archbishop laughing about this when I told him. I said, we're living through a second reformation, and everybody mm -hmm. thought I was nuts. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they're laughing anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, what I meant was literally reformation, not, I mean, the differences between Not that them. Martin Luther was showing no, up again. No, I mean, it, it, it's a completely different cultural environment, but mm -hmm. the fundamental the fundamental uh, event of the moment is this deep reformation of the way that we think about culture, the way we consider our own humanity, uh, and that's right. that creates a lot of turmoil. You said, I've always believed in our potential as Catholic Christians to be 11 in American life. It just hasn't worked out that way. Right. I mean, that was kind of the idea of Vatican II. That we were going to open the windows and everybody was going to, and the doors, and everybody was going to come Catholic. <laughs> yeah, it didn't work out that way. Father Benedict saying that was, people thought was going to happen. Yeah. Instead, the, the world rushed in. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, Benedict, I mean, to his, it's amazing. When you reread the, uh, the talks that he gave to uh, German National Radio in 69 and 70, mm -hmm. that, that uh, Ignatius has a book that's based on that, Faith in the Future, Faith in the Future. Um, he foresaw all this. I mean, the man was incredibly brilliant. He, he, he was absolutely prophetic about the mm -hmm. moment that we're at now, and he saw that more than 50 years ago. Right. Um, I think that there was a naivete. I, I, I'm, I'm a big batting two guy. Mm -hmm. okay? I need to put that out on the table. Sure. I, mean, I support it very strongly. But there was also a, a lot of naivete about what you what would happen when you did that. Right. Uh, there was a lot of centrifugal forces that were built up right. over centuries that then were suddenly released, and and uh, we got a lot of a lot of confusion. Well, I think sometimes you took to be historical. You know, people look at Trent or look at other things. They say, well, you need to understand that in the context of the times. Well, you need to understand Vatican II in the context of the 1960s too. Yeah because that had a big impact on the milieu that impacted what people thought was happening in the world at yeah. the time. Yeah, I think, uh, you, you know, Humanae Vitae in 1968, which is truly a brilliant document, but it also raised the, the uh, it highlighted the issue of sexuality in a way that hadn't explicitly been, happened before, you know? And I think <clears throat> the resistance to Humanae Vitae accelerated the whole unraveling of, of um, Sexual morality in the in the later 60s and the early 70s, right. um, in a destructive way. So, you know, uh, 
so much of our life right now is arguing over sex, which right. is ironic because right. the whole thing was supposed to be put on the back burner and not taken very seriously. Uh, you said our country is draining away, and you make the point about your eldest son uh, going to West Point. Would he go today? You'd have to ask him. Mm -hmm. I certainly wouldn't encourage him. I was going to add that, yeah. I guess, was my yeah. point. Um, and I love our country. Mm -hmm. I love the best ideals of our country, but it's not the same country I grew up in, and that's disturbing. Mm -hmm. you know? Now, in, in the chapter, you talk about bishop speak, and one of the things you talk about here, uh, the idea of collegiality, and and, and I remember hearing um, uh, the cardinal from Chicago of late, great, mm -hmm. uh, was talking about collegiality in Rome, and he was saying it doesn't mean that we all get along. It means we all teach the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, they certainly don't, right. <clears throat> pardon me, they certainly don't all get along because they're human beings, right. you know. But uh, I think the disturbing thing for a lot of people now is that they're not all teaching the same thing or they're not all, all implying the same thing in terms of, particularly of sex. I mean, sex is, ironically, <clears throat> it is really the central issue of so much of the turmoil in the church right now. So that's not been resolved as to um, our sexual identity mm -hmm. and you know, John Paul was brilliant in the sense that, and it was carried on by Benedict the Sixteenth. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was brilliant in creating a Christian anthropology. And I think what what some people are troubled about is is that seems to be unraveling now in the in the current pontificate. Mm -hmm. You know, um, because of social science, uh, the rise of social science as an arbiter of truth. Right. Right. You know, and that's dangerous. Really dangerous. You know, if you want to know, well, the father of sociology was big on religion. <coughs> oh yeah. I recall. You know, and Christopher Lash, who, does, who who never was religious, mm -hmm. was ruthless in his criticism of social science because of its destructive effect on the family. Mm -hmm. He saw, and this this was a man on the political left. Mm -hmm. He saw the family as the, the as the centerpiece of a healthy culture, mm -hmm. and social sciences directly um, undermine that in a lot of ways. To have that then invade the church. Mm -hmm. Is extremely dangerous, I think. Now you have you have church uh, you have bishops basically from urban dioceses, from rural, rural dioceses, dioceses yep. etc. This particular one talked about you know said certainly Pope Francis has great love for and uh, for the social mission of the church and for the poor, but he goes to point out that the Pope should be the principle of unity in the church, and instead Francis fosters ambiguity, which tends to feed division. Is, do you think he's ambiguous on purpose? I don't know. Okay. You know, I just I'd like to be able to answer you, but I don't know. I think he I think he I think he doesn't like the experience of rigidity that he seemed to have in Latin America, and uh, that has uh, that's kind of formed the direction that he's taken in a lot of his speak in right. a lot of his sayings. And I think I think too you I think that expresses itself in his habit of speaking very um, very loosely off the cuff. And uh, you know, on a on a human to human level, mm -hmm. that can be quite charming. Right. When you're when you're teaching and leading a global church, that can be extremely um, unsettling to a lot of people. Right. You said it was a quote from a bishop in an urban slash rural diocese. He said, "I think the way we currently form young Catholics often <coughs> vaccinates them against actually believing once they're out in the big world." Uh, what do you think he meant? Well, I think that's true. I think that to the degree that we communicate ideas, doctrines, which of course are really important, you know, uh, and don't inculcate an emotional passion for, for preaching the gospel and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we're defeating ourselves. Because as a purely intellectual, when people move out of Catholic environments mm -hmm. into a into a much more secular env uh, environment, that you're going to run into people who are very smart and don't believe. And unless you have something in your heart that keeps your ideas alive, you're you're going to lose. Right. And that's that's happened in the United States in a big in way. In the section where you talk about priests and uh, the road less traveled, the parish isn't a sacrament factory. Factory one priest says, if it becomes one, the relational aspect thing becomes impersonal, which has happened again and again. You have parishes in some dioceses with 4,000 households officially on the books, but only 100 people, uh, a surviving remnant, coming to Mass on Sundays, that they still do things the same way they always have. Mm -hmm. That's nostalgia and it kills, mm -hmm. you know. People hang on to the past in an unhappy, un unhealthy way. And um, again, I mean, the sacraments are rooted in a life. They're not sort of like 
gas station pumps that you drive in and you you get up you get gas right you know I mean it has to be rooted in a living experience of Jesus Christ and if you don't have that if the parish is just dispensing mm -hmm. sacraments um, you're gonna lose right. and, and parishes shrivel up because of that you know people have to be flexible enough to understand that the church has to to an appropriate degree adapt to the times and deal with reality on the ground and if people are stuck in their heads with, well, you know, we have to have the St. Patty's party. I think you mentioned right, that. Right, that's you know? the reference there. Yeah, yeah I right. mean, look at I'm I'm half Irish. I love St. Patrick, but 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 uh, young people are no, they're not connected with that because right. we're not an immigrant church in the same way we were 50 years right. ago. And probably most of the people in that particular parish aren't Irish anymore. <laughs> which yeah, they're Hispanic. You know yeah. what I mean? They're, they're uh, Archbishop Jose Gomez was an auxiliary right. in Denver, and I, he got to be a good friend. And he said, "What what was really weird for him as as a Mexican American was going to a St. Patty's party, which was inhabited by a whole bunch of, of uh, Anglo Irish guys, right. and talking about St. Patrick. I mean, he it was completely new to him. You right. know, it was wasn't part of his cultural experience. Right. So the church has to be adaptable in those ways. Right. Uh, this one, uh, Reverend Philip Larry. Yeah, um, Larry. Larry. I th he makes a point, which I thought was really indifference towards the faith due to secularism. Also, he was talking about what's wrong. Also, our lack of belief in the afterlife. Christianity mm -hmm. doesn't make sense without a profound right. eschatological point of view. Uh, you know, the reality is, if there's no downside to be, my behavior, why are you bothering me? Yeah. Why did he get? What does this crucifixion mean? Right. right. <laughs> you know, I mean, it. it uh, did we even need it? I mean, the the the. If you don't believe in the afterlife, if you don't have a vivid sense of it, and I don't mean a kind of a psychotic atta attachment to fear of hell, right. but I mean actions have consequences in this life and in the next. And if you don't really believe that, it all begins to fall apart. But we see in a society today that we're trying to have actions with no consequences. We see that with what's happening in big cities. People do things and we we explain away why it's really not their oh, fault. Yeah. yeah, well and, also there's a, I mean, what I suggest people who see this, uh, try to keep track of how many times you see or hear the word sin mm -hmm. used in secular or public mass media. Mm -hmm. It's disappeared, right. you know, because there isn't sin. There's like psychological problems or social, you know, problems. But um, it, it lets us all off the hook right. wrongly in terms of our personal responsibility. Now right. you've been in the church and you've been in the church bureaucracy for years. Uh, mm -hmm. One priest talks about how it's, it's harder these days. Gumption is not only not rewarded, but it's regarded with a level of suspicion that's just stunning to me. And that's why sometimes people wonder when they go to the parish and the parish priest isn't looking to do anything particular because how many times is he going to have his hand slapped? Uh, there's an old expression, parents don't want uh, justice, they want quiet. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really... <laughs> well, there's a truth to that, A, a truth in, the, in most bureaucracies, whether it's the church or not, yeah, right? Yeah, I think uh, you're quoting there, I think, a permanent deacon who's right. a married uh, married man, great guy, very sharp brain. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the peace is a good thing, but not in the face of, uh, you know, people draining away from the church, right. you know. I mean, you have to t speak the truth and take the consequences. Right. Absolutely. Uh, w there was a question you put to a religious, why do you think women's religious vocations are relatively sparse now? She said obedience is not a high value in America. Women religious say they want to be treated as adults. And then you run into that very, virtually everywhere where, you know, this idea the, of, you know, well, you're supposed to follow this because these are the rules. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, I shouldn't have mm -hmm. any rules because... I'm just as smart as you. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're not free until you learn how to learn. You, you can't lead until you learn how to follow. Obedience uh, is a good thing. In an American culture of, of intense individuality, um, unhealthy individualism, actually, um, it's sort of uh, de it's derided in a way that's unhealthy. Uh, but you're free when you're when you're obedient. Obedient right. is the, are the are the guard guardrails for your life. Uh, now it can be abused, but I don't think the church does that very often. And, and there's so much in here. You've got an homage to some good men, including uh, obviously Archbishop Chaput, who uh, people will know is, uh, he, he mentioned the quickest way to, to reform the USCCB is to limit the money it has. That means reducing offices and staff. I can't think of a single useful thing that the USCCB did for me in my more than 30 years as an ordinary. Yeah, that's a typically subtle remark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was very direct. And, and true, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I think, uh, 
I think he was more, and he served toward the end of his career in positions right. of, of uh, committee leadership in, in the USCCB, which he tried to avoid for years, but you know, finally gave into it. But I mean, he, he uh, yeah, he was very direct, and uh, structures tend to reduce, they actually sometimes work to reduce um, productive collegiality rather than to, in, rather than to help it. Mm -hmm. um, and it does, it does absorb an awfully lot of money that could be used. Right, you things. lose that entrepreneurial ability to make quick decisions yeah. and move quickly. Oh yeah, you can't. I mean, when you got a, you know, X number of hundred of bishops, you're, you know, you're not going to be able to. Yeah, herding cats. Yeah, is, one of the bishops in there talks yeah. very, very specifically about that. That it doesn't matter what the majority want. If you have an, a minority that is determined, it's going to. Right. The whole thing. And even if the document comes out, there's got to be some. Yeah. Uh, you know. Oh well, but of course. Yeah. Now, true confessions, voice of faith. Like now, now, there's a great movie. Yeah. 1981 that you relate to in this and uh, uh, your background as wanting to be a scriptwriter. Right, I did that. Uh, but, Six right, years. and you were, but you were an analyst. Uh, you found you were a better analyst than you were a scriptwriter. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I uh, yeah. Well, it. It's a memory that I have that uh, we made a living at it for six years, you know, mm -hmm. which was very nice. I was a full member of the Writers Guild of America West, which is at that time anyway a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a time. It was an environment that wasn't very friendly to people who had uh, religious convictions of a right. serious nature. And, right. and then I stumbled into working for the National Catholic Register, which was owned by the wonderful fam uh, family, the Frawleys at the mm -hmm. time. Um, and uh, that just became an addiction right. for me. I just loved it. You know, I did that for 15 years as editor in chief, and then moved on to diocesan work. But the experience, Doug. I mean, I think mm -hmm. you would be sympathetic with this. The experience of working in the church is um, one of the really great blessings of my life. Right. I mean, it it uh, it was vastly better than I thought it would be right. when I started. I love priests and bishops more now than then, and I know them a lot better, including right. their warts. You know, uh, it just it uh, the church is just a marvelous, right. marvelous witness, marvelous vessel of the truth. And, and what they're up against, and, and they need support, against. and that's what the the uh, the lay people are supposed to be doing out in the world. Uh, yeah, you know. which we don't do very well, by the way. Right, or a uh, lot of us don't. It's good to be apostolate versus ministry. Yeah. is an idea. All right, great. God Thank you so much. Doug. Thanks so much. That's okay. Francis X. Mayer, the author of True Confessions: Voices of Faith from a Life in the Church. We just scratched the surface from Ignatius Press, now available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Highly recommend checking it out. And check us out next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark. Thanks.